Good morning. Good morning. We welcome all who have gathered to worship today. And as I indicated a couple of Sundays ago, our worship services have changed because of trying to fit a 30-minute threshold. And we've emphasized different aspects of that service. And, but they've been pretty consistent. But today, we're going to switch it up again. And so we're going to start with the doxology using the old 100th of traditional um, music uh, application for that hymn. But the words are a little bit different. And so I invite you to turn to hymn 591. Hymn 591. This is a more recent um, hymn, application of the doxology. It is written by Neil Weatherhawk, who just happened to be a classmate of mine who graduated from Princeton Seminary in 1988. Um, as is appropriate, when we sing the doxology, we stand because we're singing praise to God. So if you are able, please stand and we'll sing together hymn number 591. She made this vow, O oh Lord of hosts, 
if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will you give to your servant a male child? And then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall neither drink wine nor intoxicants, nor razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was not praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to, you, said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, Lord, I'm, I'm a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and, and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house in Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. In our second lesson, we'll read together in unison, and you will find the reading in your pew Bibles on page 214. Page 214. We'll be reading 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And these are the words of prayer from Hannah, whose story um, Dewan just read. So together let us read verses 1 through 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 2. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by the Lord actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on the strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren is born seven, but she who has many gentle is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to show and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with the princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on men he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might does he prevail. The Lord, the Lord's adversary, shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, give strength to the Lord's king, and exalt the power of the Lord's anointed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the third lesson is Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verses 11 through 25. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that he can never take away sins. But when Christ is offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, 
he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then had been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is a covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is also the word of the Lord. But the end 
is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but be the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Andy Warhol once said, in the future, the artist will just point. Julie Green, an artist, said, I paint to point. Julie Green painted inmates on death row. More specifically, she painted plates that memorialized the last meal they requested before their executions. Among those meals, there was the request for an apple, chicken and dumplings, a birthday cake, because that particular prisoner had never had one. A thousand individual plates completed the exhibit called The Last Supper. Julie Green also created a separate retrospective for inmates who had been convicted, were on death row, and then later were exonerated and set free. And that set of plates was called First Meals. She found out what the first meal was requested, that was requested by the, by the newly free person. And she memorialized, commemorated those as well. When Marcel Brown was set free, he asked for a corned beef sandwich. And his mother served him that, placed it before him. And as soon as he looked at it, he said, thank God I'm home. Julie Green points us to the humanity of the ones who were found guilty. Whether put to death or released from prison, the art points to the reality that both the guilty and the innocent are human. They are people with souls. The people on death row suffered a moment we may wish to be spared, judgment day. Christians do not have to be accused of murders to be judged by God. A day of judgment awaits for all. Christians believe that there will be a time when we present ourselves before God and give an account of our lives. Will we be judged as guilty? Will we pay for our transgressions? Will we be set free? Will we be forgiven? No jury is needed on the day of judgment. Our verdict is guaranteed guilty. We are found guilty when we come before God and give an account of our lives. Our sentence also is guaranteed. The good news is that we are pardoned. The God of justice and mercy forgives us. We are forgiven. Lest there be any doubt, any question about the sentence we shall receive, believe what is written throughout the New Testament. We are forgiven. The author of the letter to the Hebrews makes clear that Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. The new Christ followers who receive this letter are encouraged to recognize this truth they are people who are loved by God and they are forgiven. When they worship God, they do not have to go through any rituals to get God's attention to plead their case for mercy. They are discouraged from bringing to worship sacrifices that are offered to take away their sins. The Hebrews are taught that a sacrifice has been made a solitary sacrifice that is sufficient for all time. 
Christ is that sacrifice. Their sins have been forgiven. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The act of forgiveness by God is called justification. God sees us as we are, writes the, the theologian Shirley Guthrie, and God says to us, nevertheless, I love you and I accept you despite your open and secret sins, despite your unworthiness and unlovableness, despite what you do to other people and yourself by your inability and unwillingness to love and let them love you. We are justified in Christ. That means that things are made right between us and God. Not because we love God, but because in Christ, God loves us. We may hold fast to the guilt born by our sinfulness, but God does not. As God said to Jeremiah, and as it was repeated to the Hebrews, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. What a wonderful amnesia God has. Our forgiveness is assured. Our lives are justified by Christ through the grace of God. Not only are we justified, we are sanctified as well. It is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Sanctification is the response that we are called to give because we have been forgiven. Like death row inmates who have been exonerated and are set free, they then form a response for the grace that they have received. We may live as a people who are set free, as a people set free by God's mercy. When we live as a sanctified people, we live for Christ. Our lives are claimed. We set our course in a particular direction. What does it mean to live as a people claimed by God? What are we to do as a people who experience this magnanimous forgiveness? What are we supposed to do with that? What are we supposed to do when we know we are completely forgiven? The ancient Israelites wondered what they were supposed to do being in this relationship with God when they had been liberated by God from Pharaoh in the book of Deuteronomy, it is written, When your children ask you in time to come, what is the meaning of the decrees and the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you, then you shall say to your children, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The Lord brought us out with a mighty hand. The Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt against Pharaoh and against his household. The Lord brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land that the Lord promised on oath to our ancestors. And then the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our lasting good so as to keep us alive as is now the case. If we diligently observe this entire commandment before the Lord our God, as God commanded us, we will be in the right. This was the understanding of the people who lived in the time of Deuteronomy. The Israelites were called to follow the commandments as they were established before them, just as we are called to follow the law of law established by Christ. To be sanctified is to live a life of obedience as a people who have been forgiven and saved. As a response to our forgiveness, we are compelled to act, 
to serve God here and now, to form an immediate response of gratitude, living a different life than if we remained imprisoned in our sinfulness. Forgiveness changes us. Forgiveness transforms us. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before God in love. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, we are given a description of how to live in love as a people who have been sanctified. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. Once again, Shirley Guthrie, the theologian, reminds Christians that to belong to the church is not just to belong to a community of believers who come together only to get something out of a church service, only to be fed, to be blessed. It is to belong to a community of believers who come together to serve, to be renewed so that they can go back into the world to serve God as they serve their neighbor. This high calling is well stated in 1 Peter, but you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness into a marvelous life. We are judged. We are forgiven. We are justified through Christ. We are set free. We live. We live for the God who saves us. Our lives are sanctified, and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control emanate from us. We have the gift of life, like the former death row inmate, Marcel Brown. We may declare, thank God I'm home. Amen. If you are able, I invite you to stand once again for giving a declaration of what we believe using this morning the Apostles' Creed, and it is printed in our bulletins. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated once more. Are there particular joys or concerns to lift up during our time of prayer? Then let us pray. God of our life, through all the circling years, we trust in Thee. In all the past, through all our hopes and fears, Thy hand we see. 
With each new day, when morning lifts the veil, we own thy mercies, Lord, which never fail. God of the past, our times are in thy hand. With us abide, lead us by faith to hope's true promised land. Be thou our guide, with thee to bless the darkness shines as light, and faith's fair vision changes into sight. God of the coming years, through paths unknown, we follow thee. When we are strong, Lord, leave us not alone. Our refuge be. Be thou for us in life our daily bread. Our heart's true home when all our years have spent. We offer this prayer and the one your son.